Tonight, we have Kate Green, Carter Foster, and William Cordova here um, to present William Cordo Cordova um, Frameworks. Carter Foster is now the Deputy Director of Curatorial Affairs and Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Blanton um, in Austin, after having been the Curator of Drawings at the Whitney for some time. And in fact, um, if I understand correctly, Carter was the first Curator of Drawings at the Whitney. Um, is that correct? Okay. All right. Okay. We don't want to deceive you. Um, for tonight's purposes, Carter's um, claim to fame is that he acquired work by the artist uh, William Cordova for the Whitney um, while there. That and the fact that he has a one of a kind, the only tattoo ever designed by the artist Ellsworth Kelly on his forearm. So um, he's done other stuff too, but I thought for the, the sake of brevity, I would just go straight to the really important stuff. Um, Kate Green is um, a curator, an art historian, and an educator who, while director of Marfa Contemporary in Marfa, Texas, had the great wisdom of commissioning the artist William Cordova um, to create one of his dense, interconnected, and poetic installations um, as the last uh, exhibition at uh, Marfa uh, Contemporary last year. She has since moved to El Paso, where she is curator um, at, El at the El Paso Museum of Art, where I feel certain she is going to um, make the El Paso Museum a major destination. So from now on, people will be stopping by Marfa because they happen to be on a trip to El Paso. <laughs> Uh, and we're just in close proximity, so why not? Uh, William Cordova, um, as you might have gathered, is the artist who brought us here tonight. Um, he is described in his bio as an interdisciplinary cultural practitioner, and as such, he lives and works in Lima, Peru, Miami, and New York. He received a BFA from the School of um, Art of the Art Institute of Chicago and an MFA from Yale. His career has been interesting with significant exhibitions, residencies, and projects across the globe. For example, he has been represented by his work in the 2008 Whitney Biennial, uh, the MoMA's PS1 Greater New York, Prospect 3 New Orleans Triennial in 2014, and the 12th Annual Havana uh, Biennial in 2015. And his work can be found in collections such as the Guggenheim, the Whitney, as we've mentioned, the Walker, the Museum of Art of Lima, and the list goes on. William's practice is based on research and engagement um, that results in poetic and explorative outcomes. So for those of you who know me, it will come as no surprise that I was immediately enamored with his exhibition, the exhibition I found at Marfa Contemporary last fall. And I was heartsick to learn that I had missed a conversation between the director of the space, the artist, and an art scholar who knew the, work, knew the work well, which is what led to the invitation to have a similar conversation here for Tuesday evenings. I am very appreciative that all the players were willing to accept that invitation. So here we are. Please join me in welcoming William Cordova, Kate Green, and Carter Foster. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Terry, for the generous invitation and um, for visiting the exhibition in Marfa, for inviting us to kind of um, have a chance to come together again as we did at William's opening um, and, and think about this exhibition. Of course, at that time, we had just opened the exhibition. Carter was seeing it for the first time. You know, we were all seeing it for the first time. So it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to think again and think together again about this exhibition. And since most of you, probably perhaps none of you besides Terry, have seen the exhibition, we thought we would begin by kind of walking um, y'all through the exhibition and then go back to looking a bit more in depth, perhaps talking a bit more in depth about certain pieces and references that arise. But for me, I mean, I think one of the, the most interesting things for me about working with William 
um, on this project and talking with Carter and others who've long engaged with his practice and talking with William is that there are so many directions to go with this work. Um, so maybe I'll share a few of the directions, a few of the frameworks through which I've been thinking about William's practice as a whole and in particular this project in Marfa, which um, involved elements, um, um, forms, um, and in fact some objects, as William often does, you know, revisits forms in new contexts to make them entirely new works. Um, and so if you've fa followed William's practice, you very well might notice some forms or even specific objects that in other exhibitions maybe even had different titles and will appear again in William's um, <laughs> upcoming exhibition at the um, Perez Art Museum in Miami that opens in J J April. May, April. Um, a survey exhibition that, that I'm certainly looking forward to, but some of these forms will reappear. So um, for me, you know, it was, it's interesting as I've talked with you and you about this project, you know, for me as William and I talked about this developing what we were gonna do in Marfa, um, three things felt very evident and still feel very evident to me um, as kind of through lines through the exhibition. Um, and three things that in fact, I think have perhaps always overlapped in William's practice, I would maybe argue, and um, overlap in Marfa. Um, spiritualism um, or the cosmos, another way, you know, a lot of people go to Marfa to, you know, gaze at the stars, and even if you don't, you, you are, you know, absolutely struck by the sense of the sublime, just being in that space and looking up. So whether it's spirit, whether you call it spiritualism or not, that kind of sense of you know being small in this in this giant place and the Marfa lights the, the Marfa lights. lights of course the Marfa lights uh, um, and Native American traditions which feel very strong for some maybe more than others in that area but you know if you look it is very evident in fact um, this form this sculpture that we're looking at here which um, we're walking into Marfa Contemporary here, um, and what you see um, formed, you know, if you flatten that form, um, it would be the kind of, now we're on the other side of that form or that sculpture, the kind of stepped pyramid pattern that you will see a lot in this exhibition and you see kind of everywhere in Marfa if you start to look. So, for example, um, in the parapet of this building here, but kind of everywhere. And, and some pieces that um, William developed for the exhibition bring that out as well. Um, and then of course references, I think all, all of these strands are evident even just in this sculpture, references to, um, to modern art or specifically to minimalism. So of course the concrete forms that we associate with Judd or we associate with Marfa. And, um, and so all of these things kind of overlapping, I think, even in this specific piece. And then something that you and William, I know, have talked about a lot or share an interest in, in um, you know, uh, references to popular culture um, that we see with this, this, uh, this boombox form. And what, what is this boombox form? What, what um, it's a specific boombox, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I speak very low, mm -hmm. so. Uh, yeah, it's not a random boombox that I selected. It's specific to um, a model from 1985 by Lasonic, which designed this particular uh, model of boombox for the uh, phenomenon of the rap music genre, uh, hip hop. And more specifically, it was designed for um, for breakdancing, even though by 1985, breakdancing, as uh, as we knew it in South Florida or in New York, was already passe. Now, in 1985, I also went to Houston, Texas, for six months, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in conversation, um, and then I, I saw uh, kids in middle school b-boying, breakdancing, and I thought, like, this is old. Because when you're 15, six months is a lifetime. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I saw them, like, this, these people are not, you know, in the know. But all that aside, um, so Lasonic was a bit um, uh, late in, in providing this type of large, oversized boom box, uh, very cheaply made. Uh, when you turned the volume up too high, it wasn't very good. Um, 
and it didn't last long, but they made different models and um, but at the same time, it, uh, I, it was my first boombox. Um, it was my brother's first boombox. It was uh, something we used to declare our space, our uh, sonic space. And, uh, and they were everywhere in the culture at certain moments. Yeah, yeah, there were much better ones. Yeah. But I think that that is interesting to me about choosing this model is yeah. it's, and I'm curious what you, you know, because you have this kind of long engagement with Williams, um, works on paper in which boomboxes and other forms of tools for communication it's oftentimes too, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. appear but I mean that was what I thought was interesting about that you choosing this particular model is that it was just after the wave it was when it became mainstream so really a tool of communication and communication almost kind of acro across cultures because it was no longer just kind of for an underground scene but for a kind of wider audience and I think that's something that I find weaving through your work too is is these kinds of distinct frameworks or or ideologies or ways of thinking that we oftentimes think of quite distinct that you weave together so these kinds of vast territories are connected and oftentimes kind of connected through tools of communication in various sorts and often uh, appearing boom boxes records um antennae um, mm -hmm. Often, um, and so I think the, the, those appear subtly in the show as well. Yeah, a lot of themes in my work have a lot to do with transmissions. So transmissions, and right? And yeah. you pick a lot of you, like records are a big thing, and um, boombox here obviously, but um, they're they're older technologies that, interestingly enough, are coming back in some mm -hmm. cases, but they signify a certain a different type of communicating in a way. Yeah, a moment. That's interesting. I see that technology as a, or I interpret it as sculptural yeah. rather than virtual technology which is all a record is uh, sculpture in a way of course it's like an three-dimensional it's also you know it's data yeah you know, a record you know as it's a, a data. holder of information yeah and so um and rather profoundly complicated objects when you think mm -hmm. about i mean they're mm -hmm. obscure now i mean they're mm -hmm. obsolete mm -hmm. now maybe mm -hmm. with digital but but incredibly yeah. difficult mm -hmm. to make when mm -hmm. you think about it mm -hmm. and, you ma and you make some too I make limited edition um, acetates, of vinyl acetates, to record specific audio. Yeah, um, and that, there, there's some in there. Yeah, maybe we'll just kind of flip through some images just to give y'all a sense of the exhibition uh, around which we can anchor um, thinking about your work. So you walked into Marfa Contemporary. If, it's a little hard to see in this image, but there was a wall behind that garage door. There was a wall, um, and you walked through the door behind here um, uh, so you couldn't see much from the windows which was uh, you know something that William and I talked a lot about was and I think you'll notice too is um, <clears throat> something that I find um, throughout you know your way of working and your work um, is making us work making us physically bend over making us intellectually kind of go down roads making us try to connect vast territories um, do some research, try to figure out what these long titles mean, um, some oftentimes involving um, multiple languages, the titles. Um, and, and, and I think that's evident. I think that will be evident as we walk through as well. Um, and so when you walked into the door, you saw this library of books, um, reference material that William, uh, it was a collaboration between William and an um, uh, uh, artist, uh, um, uh, activist, living in Marfa, who has an amazing collection of books uh, uh, through which uh, William and he connected about, uh, had a lot of kind of shared interests. Sure. Um, what were some that struck you about Sandro's collection of, of books that we then um, had in, in the exhibition? Were there specific you know, books or it, subjects that you were like, this makes sense to be here or? Uh, he had uh, specifically newspapers. Mm -hmm that were published in Mexico in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And they were like underground newspapers, almost like how Rolling Stone magazine used to be published as, a, as an actual newspaper mm -hmm. yes. in San Francisco when it mm -hmm. started back in 1966, and um, where it revealed things that were not necessarily in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily about music. So these newspapers that Sandro had uh, were addressing architecture of necessity, um, how to make adobe, um, for people who may not necessarily, may have access to the materials, but not know, not, may not know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and just other very practical things in this newspaper, 
kind of a how to mm -hmm. rather than you know Theorizing. without without having YouTube mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. where they show you how to make things mm -hmm. that are really mm -hmm. practical mm -hmm. uh, that newspaper oh. operated that way mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so it was um, it was something that uh, in Peru we didn't have mm -hmm. uh, just people passed it on not to say that in Mexico people were not passing it on but this was also a way of, of maintaining a certain information mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. this hard copy mm -hmm. uh, version and um, and so the copies he had are sometimes the only copies left, mm -hmm. you know, there might not be any more. Mm -hmm. And he's slowly digitizing them mm -hmm. and putting them up online mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's what really struck me the most. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because you, 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 like mm -hmm. we were talking about doing a film series in Marfa that we didn't get a chance to do, but one of the films mm -hmm. that you were thinking about was um, a Cuban film about indigenous um, building practices, right? Oh, that was, yeah. um, there's like a, a how-to, a how-to film of like how to build your yeah. own, I don't even remember exactly. Well, technically it's, it's a short 11 minute documentary by filmmaker Nicolas Guillen Landrian, who was an Afro-Cuban experimental filmmaker, uh, one of the first students to graduate post-revolution in 1962. And he uh, was making these very short experimental films and gained a lot of uh, attention really fast. And his young age was about 22, 23. And he was very prolific. Um, he was censored a lot because this is during the infancy stage of the Cuban Revolution, the first 10 years. So it's very, very uh, strict and very rigid uh, parameters to work within. And so if you deviated from that or did anything, it might be interpreted as a challenge or as uh, going against uh, government policies. So he incorporated certain sounds and music. Uh, some of it was from the Beatles um, music. And that was considered subversive. And so because it was from the West. Um, it's not unique to Cuba. I mean, in Japan, they were doing the same thing. In Israel, they were doing the same thing, censoring these, um, this, this type of music. So uh, he was censored for a few years. And when they allowed him to go back and make films again, he did a film called um, uh, to build a, to construct a building. Mm -hmm. But within this short documentary, uh, he incorporates rhythms, mm -hmm. oh, Afro-Cuban right. rhythms, uh, visually also, mm -hmm. visually with text and through just the physical forms of the workers moving around mm -hmm. and the way that he, he uh, chopped up and edited the film. Mm -hmm. So people might look at it today and say, oh, well, there's nothing big about that. But back then it was actually a lot more revolutionary because films were not edited that way, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that rhythm, um, those rhythms are something, a rhythm mm -hmm. is something that mm -hmm. I, you know, as I, as, as, as we work together, I notice that is a kind of part of your way of working. Um, and also you kind of washed over the show with, um, we'll get to it in a second. Um, well, a lot of that is because I was pretty exposed to his, Nicolas Guillén Landrian's uh, nephew of um, Nicolas Guillén, who was a Cuban poet and very well accomplished. And he actually developed this, this type of poetry where when you read it out loud, it has a certain rhythm that's trying to uh, emulate uh, drums, mm -hmm. African-Cuban drums. And the, the one that really did it for me was called uh, Sense Maya. And so a lot of this material was available for us in Peru. And this is during the 70s and during a, also a, a different period in our country that was uh, changed later on. And so we don't have that same type of education anymore, but, uh, but I was pre-exposed to this. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that's why I gravitated to is, you know, Nicolas Guillén Landrian, who is not well known, mm -hmm. especially here um, or outside of Cuba, mm -hmm, until mm -hmm. around 2002, mm -hmm. some of his short films have been coming out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. But I mean, I think, and, and I think that kind of way of working is evident in the, in the was it evident in the show, and I think also evident in the show, you know, um, uh, which consists of the main space of the show, which um, was taken up by this eight foot tall um, scaffold like structure that it forms the shape of a spiral. Um, so, uh, as you can see, various pieces were kind of pressed against the sides of the wall. So, uh, what we might think of as like the art objects in the show were pressed against, in, in some cases, literally pressed against. The, this one, I think, was not even, was held up just by the pressure of the beams. I don't think it's even pinned to the wall. 
I can't remember. What piece? This, this the the record uh, plan. The oh the gold. The gold, yeah. Piece. No, that was uh, a couple. <coughs> was of it's the Howard Johnsons, right? That's yeah, cool. the Howard Johnsons. It was stapled. Yeah, it was okay. Um, but just to give us a sense, so we just, in terms of if you had experience to show, you would have walked past this library here, then come into the main space, um, past a couple of pieces, small pieces installed around the sides of this series of walls, and this um, sculpture with a feather here. And um, I think I have, here's, uh, gives you a bird's eye view of the, um, of the installation. Um, about three dozen works, a mix of um, pieces that were made in Marfa and for the exhibition and, and pieces that were kind of parts of previous iterations of works. Um, and all variety of media, and as you can see, I know it's hard to see, but the titles um, here are quite lengthy and um, <clears throat> combine various, various languages. I think what oftentimes, um, even for, for me, I think, certainly, um, what oftentimes kind of I skip over in my kind of um, desire to go down these rabbit holes of, of research that I like to go down with you mm -hmm. is your attention to material and to art his, the, the kind of various layers in the objects themselves and um, the art historical references, which I know is something that you know, you have always engaged with. And and I think it's work. interesting that it gives you, there's, I don't want to say it's an aggression, but like you go in the space and you have to sort of figure out where to go. Where to go. You have to crawl under. Mm -hmm. I remember I had to crawl mm -hmm. under the scaffolding. I'm a tall mm -hmm. guy, so it was like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. to, to get to the next part of the exhibition. And you like giving these structured spaces in your, in your work because you've done things with, you've referenced architecture and, and other installations and it and these this is interesting because it, it, you, you're not pinned to the wall but you you're right. forced to almost kind of close, i mean you had like about up. we had like just ada you know compliance right. 36 inches i believe um around the perimeter here i mean this space was larger but then as you went as you turn the corner past this suite of i think it's 10 um 10 i think it's 10 collages very recently done collages right. Um, and, and kind of decide, do I pause? Do I look at these as objects? I mean, it kind of um, dislocated, certainly for me, and I, as in my observation, many viewers' experience was, do I, do, I, you know, do I contemplate each of these as objects? Do I go under? What is my, you know, how do I navigate this space? And, um, you know, and I, I think that's something that you've, um, you've talked in interesting ways to me about. What, any, any thoughts on, like, you know, making things difficult for us? <laughs> well, that's, it's a relative. Uh, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think about these designs, uh, like the spiral, uh, you know, it, it's influenced by sacred geometries and things that are organic or religious or spiritual. Um, it can be secular, but um, the points of reference are sacred geometries. So what I wanted to do is uh, kind of reactivate the way that individuals or groups uh, experience spaces. Sometimes we become so um, complacent about the spaces that we go into every day, whether it's a supermarket or a home, uh, a museum, or, a, or even a, you know, a mosque, a church, you know, a synagogue. And we don't necessarily pay attention too much anymore. So limited to the museum space or the white cube, I wanted to um, redesign the space with, with this structure, this organically built because it's made out of wood structure, and provoke people to, um, I guess, um, reconsider how they experience the visual work. So some of it is behind the scaffolding, like the yellow piece, or some of these pieces. There's not enough space for you to back up and see it clearly. Dense so, shadows. I mean, sure. we talked about you know um, when we were lighting this, you mm -hmm. know, wanting used to museum practice, wanting to you know get rid of shadows, and you mm -hmm. were happy with the shadows and yeah. and you know. Making well, I wanted to provoke intimacy mm -hmm. also. Does mm -hmm. does scaffolding and stacking have a symbolic? Oh yeah. Um, um, meaning to you because you use it a lot. Yeah, scaffoldings, I guess it depends on your, your background and where you are, uh, means so many different things. Like in the U.S., you won't see too many scaffoldings, or you might, if you see it in cities, they're usually uh, veiled with nice um, 
um, yeah, like viewer viable, friendly, or, yeah, yeah, orange, or has Tyvek or some kind of company. They put logos ads on, on it. even sometimes. Yeah, uh, so that people don't see this, this the construction, you know, the process of. But it's not so much in other countries where it's just work being done. I know some of it is veiled for protection so that dust doesn't get out. But uh, for me, it's also about fluidity because um, in other places, it's, the construction is, is constant. It's something's constantly being taken down, something's constantly being taken up. And time and space differs a lot, whereas in Miami, for instance, uh, last year, it only took four months to create this huge mega supermarket, four months. I would be scared to go in there because I'm thinking to get you know, the, the, uh, the permits passed for this in four months, you know, somebody got you know, a don't. lot of pocket in their money, or money in their pocket. Uh, and so it might take 10 years for a structure to be built somewhere else uh, for economic reasons, for other reasons. But time is also just interpreted differently, you know. It symbolizes a temporary, a, a yeah. constant influx, temporary, yeah. but then if it continues, it's... Yeah, it almost, uh, like the spiral, it has yeah. a lot to do with infinity. So the spiral for me was that. And instability, maybe to some degree, because it's there to shore things up. Mm -hmm. but like, yeah. And you're stacking something, it's also... And like an mm -hmm. opening, I mean, when I think about the spiral, when mm -hmm. I was reading about the spiral, it's like a, con you know, a kind of uh, endlessly opening and closing at the same time. You know, sure. Bo both both are happening and in some ways, you know, scaffold is like a building and then an ending and, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of constant in that sense The Guggenheim well. Museum, you yeah. know, the spiral. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's all I, th I think of the term, I was writing down adjectives that just, I thought mm. described your work earlier today and like it, rickety came up in my head because I was looking at something you drew and it was this mm. rickety looking sure. thing that's... Fragile? Know, yeah, fragile. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, that to me, I think about your, like, um, some of the art historical references um, that I think we have images of some. We can come back to some of these, but um, we'll come well, back. Well, you but, know, it, it's alluding to that type of fragility. The fragility is in the content of the components mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. that scaffolding. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Say sorry. that again? I can't. Um. <laughs> but then sometimes you, I, I think, I, I, we, I think we, we talked about this the last time, the use of gold is really interesting to me too because that sure. symbols a kind of more permanence as something that's valued in a certain way. As well, I'm visual... interested in alchemy. Yeah. You right. know, transform, magical yeah. transformations. Yeah. Um, the boombox could be part of you know, that alchemy, how it changed and how it's interpreted through pop culture now. When you use gold, do you actually use real gold leaf? Or do you, um, no. No, it's too no. expensive. Can we get back to a full screen view? Thank you. No, it's not because it's expensive, but it's, it's, it's hard about to work transforming with. something yeah. that doesn't necessarily, uh, that, you know, economic is not worth that much. Right. It's just because when you put, you often put, you'll put something that's very th thought of as like a graffiti, a segment of graffiti on gold ground. So it's this, you know, graffiti's thought of as like something that goes with urban decay and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And gold is thought of as this, it, 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 it brings something up. And I love that. Yeah, historically, graffiti is always uh, seen as that, you know, yeah. urban decay, ghetto. Um, there's always a lot of shame implied to it. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting how that's changed, though, because look at... Well, when, in the early degree. 80s, when yeah. Keith Haring and Kenny Scharf, all these artists Lee started going to get yeah. their degrees yeah. at SVA, then it became something else. Uh, there's money to be made for in there. Yeah, um, right. But the specific... The, the references that I make are usually historical individuals who are pioneering the, uh, uh, this type of uh, artwork and, uh, from the early 70s. Yeah. Such as in this piece here, which was, so then now we're kind of entering, we've just like rounded this corner, gone past this room with a video um, of a beach in Peru that kind of washed over in terms of sound and light over the whole installation. I kind of thought of it as a, as a moving sculpture. That's how it, mm -hmm. it, it, it shaped the exhibition for me. Um, and then once you went past that, you could choose to go under. You needed to go under if you wanted to go any further. There was no entrance. So if you wanted to go, if you wanted to experience more of the exhibition, you needed to go under. Um, and then, um, and also look up. Um, you needed to look up too. Um, there were works installed on a kind of second story, so to speak, and 
um, and those all drawings in cacao. Um, do you want to talk any about those drawings that were, there was this, there were six of them in the exhibition installed in, or maybe eight, no six. Yeah. Sure. Um, but I should add, yeah. Um, I don't know if the audience is getting a proper interpretation of what this installation may have looked like, but there's a lot of components. Um, are you all familiar with 2001 A Space Odyssey? Yeah? Enough? People? Yeah. Okay. I saw, oh, we've got a witness up there. Okay. Um, I saw it when I was 14 the first time. I did a lot of extensive reading before I saw it, because I usually do that just out of trauma. That's another story. And so I watched it and over and over and over. And it took me a long time to figure out and to experience the film in all its layers. It was like an artichoke, you know, you have to peel it away. Um, and so these, these installations that I, um, that I create often take a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, interpretations, but uh, you have to visit it many times. Like an onion, just so many layers, or yeah. a spiral, or, or a yeah. galaxy with a lot of stars. Or sure, sure. <clears throat> uh, but in general, my, my work is that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because there's, there's always a lot of layers to a lot of the, the, the topics that I'm investigating, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of entry points. Mm -hmm. So it's not intentionally done to confuse people or to make it difficult at all. Um, it's just a lot more involved, yeah. And mm -hmm. you, sometimes you can come and see one piece, and it's, you know, there's, I don't think there's an example, but there's sometimes I render, draw things, you know, um, really well so that it's, uh, you can have a nice introduction to the work, while other pieces might be more abstract. Mm -hmm. So I go back and forth. And there's a real contrast and richness of materials that's usually used. Um, both it could be in an individual drawing or yeah. work or and within a show like this where you're, it's, it's individual experiences of looking at like something that's more or less flat mm -hmm. and then yeah. having to circumnavigate something. Listen, Yeah, watch, some people engage yeah. more with mm -hmm. materials, other yeah. people with just the visuals. Mm -hmm. um, the cacao drawings, um, it's cacao from Peru and the designs, well, there's no examples of designs, but... Um, yeah, yeah, I think we have some. There's a couple you can see well, but these are not the ones... Are you thinking about the ones that are based on Tuanaku architecture? Is that what you mean? Well, they're all, it's all interrelated. I was trying to create this intersection between uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the architect's uh, designs, uh, furniture, and the, the, the Roby House, and the furniture in the Roby House, as well as the... the the windows and the Tiwanaku from Bolivia architecture, and also just Andean architecture in general, um, also Maya and Japanese. Um, those awesome. that influenced, yeah, <laughs> that influenced Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. So there's all these intersections. Um, depending on what you're informed by in your background, you might come in and say, "Oh, that's Frank Lloyd Wright." Somebody else might say, "Oh, that's Tiwanaku," and might not know who Frank Lloyd Wright is. So, but we, we're all meeting in the same place, but we don't have we proper do. examples. Yeah, we, we do. We do. Hold on. <laughs> um, we have, let's see. Here oh, we there go. you go. So, okay. here's a, a pair of, the, of, of two of the um, cacao, drawings. cacao drawings and then um, some of the references that you were just mentioning. Right. This For is, example. Yeah. This is um, Puerta del Sol. Uh, sun portal. So some of the uh, the but, sketches come from, or the drawings come from that. And also, you know, I thought this was really interesting when William, when you first visited Marfa and we went to Judd's, you, you, you had been doing these cacao drawings for some time mm -hmm. and thinking, among other things, about these courtyards at Tuanaku. Um, right. And then knew when, when William and I began talking about um, doing something in Marfa, <clears throat> you had already done research about Judd and his interests mm -hmm. and knew when we went to the, the block. So this is now we're in, um, this is uh, Donald Judd's uh, essentially like his ho ho domestic compound in Marfa. 
and he um, manipulated or changed some buildings and the spaces. One, there's, they tightly control images, so it's hard to get good images of this, but it's, uh, um, this is a courtyard that he created with adobe walls. He had adobe makers in Marfa, artisans, create this courtyard that you um, learned or you researched before mm -hmm. you even got to Marfa long ago that he was, he too was interested in Tiwanaku architecture, right? Or Andean right. architecture? Or? Uh, specifically, uh, Tiwanaku Inca mm -hmm. architecture mm -hmm. that he was studying at Columbia University. While so these very school. same kind of spaces that yeah. you had been looking at, right? Such as this. And then he basically emulated this the same courtyard mm -hmm. in in Marfa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but he used adobe. These are stone. Mm -hmm. And you've dealt with this issue of like taking an object that's used in one context culturally mm -hmm. and. It, you, it migrating to a different culture and being used in a different way, and it's fascinating. Yeah, I think it was incorporated for the same reasons. Um, you mean he, you said he? He was, he was also, you know, he was doing, are you kind of saying he was doing a similar kind of remixing? As Carter yeah. was well, saying I just think about the, in the issue of language and how that, you know, mm -hmm. like a, an object's called one thing and mm -hmm. it's used for one thing, and then mm -hmm. it, you change the context, and it's the same object, mm -hmm. and it's used in another way. Because mm -hmm. there's that, yeah. is it a drum or something that you've used in your work? I can't remember the... The cajon? Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. Yeah, the cajon, which is a drum, an Afro-Peruvian drum, which looks very similar to um, speakers right. from the 70s or to early 80s. Right. Wooden stat speakers. So the same, yeah. this... Like yeah, the yeah. form that we're looking at here. Yeah. Which is a, a sculpture of yours, an installation of yours from the early aughts called Machu um, Picchu. Or Machu called Picchu after different dark. Things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good time. yeah. And so, You're yeah, when I was a child, I would see them in the U.S. and I thought there were people throwing away drums because mm -hmm. they were just tossing these out and they would take out the, you know, the speaker itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, later on, I started collecting about 200 of them, created this piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, also, like the idea of the discarded seems to have a lot of interest for you. And yeah, we and don't discard things in Peru. We just reuse them for something uh -huh. else. We've been recycling for the last 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> so. We have a lot to learn from you. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there's no detail to this, no? Of this particular piece? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. What were you wanting to look at? What oh, the ephemera on the side. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's too bad. There's not. This is this material here that William's talking about. There are just different components, some texts, uh, some vinyl jackets alluding to the piece, mm -hmm. just completing the piece more and forming it more. Mm -hmm. It's not a a piece. It's a sonnet drum in a way. Mm -hmm. It's not a piece that you you listen to anything. For me, it also almost seems like a steely, or like it also has a kind of. Uh, a kind of the gravity of Definitely. like a pilgrimage site yeah. and you know like Machu Picchu is for many well, then, yeah. you know it goes up like this it's mm -hmm. got a solid mm -hmm. right. well it's based on a burial mound mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's based on the uh, Afro-Burgian drum mm -hmm. so there is that Andean African mm -hmm. mix in, mm -hmm. uh, in that piece with these almost like offerings yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah so these are, this is um, in, you know, and again, like William was talking about the various references that he was interested in and in, in creating this exhibition. And this is, um, for those of you who haven't been, in the inside of a room in Judd's compound. So, you know, these these um, various traditions that, that William is interested, Judd to, amongst many others, right, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and here's some other uh, images of other references that have been important to you. Um, that appear in your work, and, and maybe the first, perhaps the most important. I think this this image kind of references a lot of of, of strands that reappear in your work to me. Yeah, this like this building, is building family. Um, yeah, this is uh, things in flux. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the uh, it's an intervention. This functions as a photograph where I just went and I made a concrete boombox and I inserted a book inside of it uh, and then I you know then I left it out here with a, a Peruvian gourd in a um, not a random place but a, a historical space that was being uh, reconstructed in Miami this yeah is Miami. In, in Miami um, 
the writer Eldridge Cleaver lived there for uh, about two years back in 1995-96 and um, and I used to listen to his radio show in Miami back then and so um, this house was being um, gutted out so I found out about it and I decided to leave the boombox there with a, a poetry book inside. Um, I don't know what happened to the boombox but I photographed the piece and so the piece is actually just a photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now it's, it's probably finished now. It's about two years ago. What about your relationship to mark making? Let's get to um, say it in a, a major piece like this, or I think we have images of some, well, here's another large collage, but then um, we don't have any close ups of these suite of 10, but on small and, and large scale, this. <laughs> relationship mm -hmm. to mark making and the forms that appear again or you know I don't know if there are certain things that I think the large ones are more meditative meditative for me mm -hmm. they take a, a lot longer I don't make large works as much uh, at least 2D works it, they usually take like two to four years sometimes um, your drawings often have a on the smaller scale often have this you know great contrast between a highly skilled line and mm -hmm. delicate rendering of something and then it'll be on like a used stained piece of paper or something but then maybe in another one maybe has gold leaf I, the contrast of these yeah many different materials and mediums in, in one thing has always been really interesting yeah i tend to reclaim materials rather than go to the art supply store yeah um and it gives it a very yeah. specific feel it's very um yeah. Um, you feel the weight of like history. use and history, yeah. and like uh -huh. something. Like, and, and, it, and you and you create a space where that becomes meaningful. Like mm -hmm. this, the oil stain that was there becomes, you know, you read it in terms of what else, whatever else is on the sheet. Yeah, I'm thing. definitely interested in reactivating that or or um, highlighting those things because uh, it's it is part of that material, and so for me it's not so much about erasing at all, but uh, provoking further investigation as to why it was left there. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I might have a, an intervention, or sometimes a collaboration with stains or marks that were mm -hmm. there already, um, to kind of appreciate that, uh, those, those marks or that history. And, and also creating sacred. a kind of world around them. I mean, yeah. on a large scale, you know, you can think about th this feels like a universe, a constellation, a kind of world alive with mm -hmm. vectors. And it's very and live in the space because it's it projects out in the space. It's not framed or glazed. It's like very much, and you want to touch it even though you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. And this, in particular, is um, the support, the, the the physical support of this one is a series of old maps that you've kind of intervened on, and then even you know put put additional materials onto. Um, on a smaller scale, though, too, um, these, this suite of 10, and I thought that was some, an interesting thing that came out, I believe it was in a conversation between you two, maybe it was you and Robert Pruitt, um, mm -hmm. was this uh, kind of deep dive into other worlds, you know, through sci-fi or through your, you know, relationship to reading or, you know. Um, yeah, some of the smaller ones are. kinds of worlds, but I think mm -hmm. on small and large scale, you create those in your graphic works, which is really interesting. And I think that has something to do with this reuse of materials. Like you, you um, capitalize upon this um, mm -hmm. previous use to kind of create this world. Well, I started, um, a lot has to do with the isolation and being displaced um, growing up in, in, in Miami in the 80s. Uh, what I gravitated to in order to not go insane was was to read comic books and read a lot of science fiction, and so that's how I balanced my you know my everyday, and and then after that, um, when you read enough, you look at enough, you also want to do it. So I started doing comic books, and I was doing I don't know, like four or five different comic books a day for about six years and uh, you know you, you gain a certain discipline um, and you, you develop your writing skills, your drawing skills and so a lot of the smaller drawings these um, uh, are kind of influenced by that um, you, you don't see that directly anymore but but it's there that's that's the type of conversation that we were having at the, at, the, uh, at Marfa uh, is, is, Do you think your tendency to work serially to some degree is influenced by that looking at comic books and that kind of like 
box yeah. to box to box type of thing. Yeah, it has yeah. that structure. Yeah. Um, and then and then these bigger arcs too. You know mm -hmm. that there's such a there's such there's such a um, through lines between you know from one project to the next. So like w you sometimes work in create a series, but then also you know all of your work seems to be a series in a way. Sure. Yeah. Um, I saw that you had some images by Basquiat. What's that for? Oh, just cause, why not? Okay. <laughs> just one. Glenn. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good old Glenn. Mm. <laughs> okay. um, but I think, you know, one of the things that's coming out as you're talking um, is this kind of pivoting between, um, you know, old and new materials, worlds, and high I think low. that's high-low, you know, and creating a, a your own universe with all of that. And I think that's something that um, is interesting to me, and I just wanted to point out one other part of the project which I think points to that, or one other part of the project in Marfa which points to that, which was this series of um, concrete spheres that existed not only, they were made, this image is just because they were they were made um, through some workshops that we did in Marfa with people in Marfa, but these concrete spheres um, that existed on the top of the scaffold creating the shape of a big dipper um, with a few extra stars combined. And then also the same spheres or a group of spheres were out in Marfa at locations in Marfa that um, and those of you who are familiar with Marfa might know that, you know, Marfa is historically quite segregated along a number of lines. And so these spheres, um, at least theoretically connected places that would otherwise be quite disconnected and connected inside of Marfa Contemporary with outside of Marfa Contemporary. Um, and so that I think is something, this kind of connection, transmission, communication mm -hmm. to create uh, another world is something that I find kind of really runs throughout um, your work. Yeah, there's also the scaffolding. Um, you could go through it, but because of the height, um, you couldn't see the top of it unless you were a bird looking down through the skylight. Um, and that was intentional because um, I wanted to create a piece that wasn't necessarily for everybody to experience uh, directly. Um, the constellation that you had up there where we created these concrete spheres and we placed them in different locations throughout Marfa was, uh, was very strategic because we placed them in um, locations where there's, that which is about um, having, where people come together, have exchanges like the local library, the barber shop, the radio program. Uh, cemetery. Yeah, the cemetery. Um, places like that. Um, and and I think I, it's still I, up, no? Um, yeah, Inside. some of them, some yeah. of them, yeah. Um, but I thought, I thought um, one of the, the sweetest ways that you articulated why you chose certain sites was it is it places where elders imparted information to others mm -hmm. in the community. Um, yeah. I thought that was an interesting way of thinking about of thinking about spaces and thinking about public spaces. Well, it has a lot to do with um, the way that I grew up and who was who I was constantly around and who, you know, who were the wise ones in the family or in the community. And those type of um, experiences and lessons that I learned, I've always gravitated to that uh, and still do. So I find that to be uh, very important in, also in my practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. The transmission of, transmission of information. Speaking of transmission, Information. Um, there maybe this is a good time for us to. Mm. Unless you, did you have a question no, or no, thought on no, your lips? No, no. Yeah, that you want to. A good time to Bloody. see what thoughts have arisen for others here. Questions. Okay, I'll please, Terry. Um, to begin with, and I hope everybody can hear this. I am so blown away and I feel so cheated because I did not spend enough time. I feel like I saw a fraction mm -hmm. of the exhibition being in it, which is both, I mean, that's part of the appeal. Like, it, I know I didn't get it all, which makes me kind of love it all the more. And that takes me to a kind of passing comment you made, William, about intimacy um, in the space. And 
if I understood maybe what might read to someone else as uh, creating obstruction so that you, but, and you, but if I understood you actually saw that as creating intimacy? Correct. Yeah. I, uh, I often tend to, to do that when I install works that might seem really aesthetically stimulating mm -hmm. um, rather than just place it in the front so people walk in, look, and then move on. Mm -hmm. um, I'll put something, in, I'll, I'll, I might mount it much lower to the ground or much higher. Um, you can just see to, like things yeah. on the floor. Just to slow down the way that people read artworks. Because sometimes uh, I'll go to an institution, they'll, they'll already have a preconceived idea of how, what the height should be. Yeah. And that's okay. 57 um, center. Exactly. <laughs> and so I, I tend to just lower them a little more or put them in places that you, know, you won't necessarily consider should be the proper space. Not to be disobedient, but uh, just to slow down how we navigate, just through life, you know, because we're kind of always on the go. Um, and we don't, we may not experience or see something because, I mean, I see a lot of people don't even look at the sunset in the morning because they're, you know, they're, they're typing. And, uh, and that's fine, but sometimes we have to pause. And it means so much when we catch something in our periphery, like even mm -hmm. in our everyday like somehow we have a relationship with that thing that yeah. we almost miss, and that's the feeling I get from, from this installation. And a lot of the themes in the work have a lot to do with uh, erasure, uh, marginalized histories, uh, or individuals. Um, and so sometimes when an individual actually takes the steps and, and finds something on their own, they can own that experience and value it a lot more. And so that's a, a lot of reasons why I do If you it. look at the, the drawing with the, I believe it's a Howard Johnson's, right? Right. That, that you had to, it kind of forced you to be up against that drawing when you were in there. And the, it, it, made, it made you feel it in an intimate way and that you wouldn't have if you felt like you had to be back. And it almost gave you permission to, to do that. So, I mean, I think when, when, when we were talking about this piece, um, installing this piece, um, William, you said you wanted to stick it somewhere where people couldn't like selfie, you know, selfie, take selfies with, with it. You know, that, that this is arguably the piece that people want to stand back, you know, it's how many feet wide? Uh, five by seven. <laughs> so, you know, you, a traditional hang of this piece would be to give it, you know, its own huge wall, mm -hmm. you know, pride of place, a lot of space, and you did the exact opposite, you know, and made us go close you know, made us kind of, um, and, and you couldn't see it all. And I think that speaks to what you were saying, Terry, is literally, you know, you, you can't with your work, which makes it all the more compelling. I agree that, you know, I could keep thinking and writing about this forever and find new ways to think about it, that it, it doesn't ever <clears throat> close for me. You know, it's a, it, kind of an infinitely expanding universe in that way for me. Um, but it's, all, it's it also not the only way to that I would present a piece. You know, it also depends on the place mm -hmm. and the time. Mm -hmm. so Have you presented this say, particular piece as an object that it can, you know, gets its own wall and? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have. Uh, the, a little bit of background. It was uh, Howard Johnson's. A lot of Howard Johnson's buildings, the architecture, designed by Rufus Nims, who uh, <laughs> actually lived in Miami and was one of the first uh, architects to design and. Um, built basically uh, baby boomer mm -hmm. homes mm -hmm. um, out of concrete. So mm -hmm. a lot of them in North Miami, mm -hmm. and he retired and lived there. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, but there's something in the roof of this building that he designed that doesn't seem to have any actual use mm -hmm. you know, no, or actual function. Mm -hmm. They're like bunkers that he created. And that was something I was also interested in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it used to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and this one is just kind of floating. Um, it, has, it has, again, like a stack of records here, um, almost another little, you know, reliquary <clears throat> in a way, or a spot to, to kind of pay homage to. Uh, it's ephemera that, that, that uh, contextualizes the, uh, the, the piece the more. The research? Uh -huh. Yeah, the research, the, uh, the structure. Uh -huh. the and then what's this? Floating um, in the sea of gold. 
It's it's a radio with a piece of wood. Uh huh. Yeah. Transmission across territories. Yeah. Something like that. Information. Yeah. Set off in the sea of gold. Yeah. <coughs> There's no stream of consciousness. It's, it's very specific, but we don't have a detail of it, so I won't elaborate. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Can you talk about the the, the constellation orbs? concrete ones that you were making with a group of people? Right, that was, uh, we created a constellation of uh, the Big Dipper. Right, so when it's installed, they kind of look like in, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. they look like they were being cast out of like tennis balls. Tennis balls, yes. Okay, so, yeah. so I kind of got that before I even saw the tennis balls mm -hmm. being used because it feels like this sun bleached like tennis ball in the yard that you find. So I'm getting this vibe that there's like this kid up here, you know, throwing the tennis ball against the wall and making those crazy imprints. On them. <laughs> so yeah, you're creating this very intimate space that we can't access. It's like a, because I'm assuming nobody could get up there. Right. right? Yeah. Although I'm sure, did people try? <laughs> <clears throat> no, yeah. people, because people treated, but for the most part, people treated the scaffold as if it were an object. People generally, I mean, people would say, like, during events, people would lean on it a bit, but people kind of mm -hmm. treated it as an art object. Not that we said it was. It was certainly, we would, we kind of had to, like, incur, nudge people to engage. You know, people's first instinct um, was to, you know, walk around the exterior and not be sure how to engage with the, with the you know, structure. Yeah. Yeah. Um... But so this is the interior version, and then there's the exterior version, which is throughout Marfa itself, repeating the same constellation. Were they small or large? They were a little bit smaller than, it's about... Same size. Yeah. The same size. Same, this exact same okay. sphere. So we cast all of them in this workshop, mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then they were placed, some of them placed inside and some of them placed outside. Yeah, yeah. and they, peop, the public was invited to make them themselves and bring something personal. Some, some people use it as an ingredient. And so some people brought hair, locks of hair, or a little bit of dirt from their yard, things like that. Um, Poem, poems, like mm -hmm. letters. Um, and, uh, and I think that you know, s spoke in interesting ways to me about your relationship to building and, and building in your family. You talked about, you know. Hmm. Um, yeah. My, uh, what my people uncle. do with building and how it's invested. And that's certainly a big conversation in Marfa mm -hmm. is, is the investment of certain materials with kind of symbolic power, like adobe in particular in Marfa. Um, and so that kind of played into this piece and, and your, your background as well. Yeah, my, my uncle was a, a contractor and an architect and built all the family homes. So... When he was doing construction work, he would often incorporate you know, his, his gloves or shoes into the, into the mix and leave it there. And uh, I always find that interesting. So sometimes I tend to incorporate uh, literature. Uh, I'll put it in a Ziploc bag and then incorporate it. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I have a two-part question. One is uh, Carter and Kate, you both have had different experiences with William curatorial and in the acquisition process. Could you talk a little bit about that dynamic in each experience? I'm, and in particular, I'm curious about what that curatorial dialogue was in Mark. Well, I, it's pretty easy in my case because I didn't know him. Uh, I met him much later, actually. So much easier in that case. Uh, but I saw his work and thought it was, I, I mean, I, I got, thought it was great and I worked to acquire it for the Whitney. And, and I did that three times, I think. So, um, mm -hmm. and I don't think. Know him over the course of I didn't, no. Uh, I, I think we met when, when we did that thing with Leslie Hewitt. Right. Sekima Jenkins. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, that was the first time I believe we met. Yeah, that was um, the first time. So I just interpreted all on my own without his help. <laughs> <laughs> what did your colleagues um, uh, People admired his work and we kept doing it. I mean, I was head of a, an acquisition committee or I ran an acquisition committee for the Whitney and I kept bringing his work back because at the Whitney we like to collect in depth if we, um, you know, and he had been in a biennial so there was a lot of context there. Um, and I thought, I personally, and I mean, I thought and still do that his, he had a really innovative approach to drawing, the materials of drawing and the conceptual approach to drawing, which I just found fascinating. So that's, that's why I thought it was important to bring to the collection. And um, William and I go back a, a quite a while. I mean, I guess my first engagement with William's work was, vis it was visiting you when you were at the core. 
when I was working at a different museum years ago um, when I was at Art Pace and did a studio visit. And I remember thinking quite distinctly that um, A, like I didn't, I felt like you were you were running circles around me intellectually and I didn't know kind of how to navigate that space I remember in the in the studio visit and um, and I also remember feeling really drawn to the way you were working with materials and a kind of sacred a sense of the sacred or the sublime in the space and I didn't really know what to do with that I was really in, intrigued and I kind of just it just stayed with me and, and an opportunity didn't arise at that time, but it really stayed with me. And then, I don't, I don't know. Did we did we just reconnect after I was in Marfa and uh, and and really wanted to explore doing something together? Yeah, I think so. We we met about eleven years yeah. ago. Yeah. And then reconnected. Yeah. 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 And then um, and the and the process was uh, was you know as it is in, in many such cases really began with, are you interested? You know, what do you think about Marfa? Do you want to do something? Do you have thoughts? Does it arise for you? What could you imagine doing here? I really wanted um, uh, to do something that would be specific to that context and, um, and true to, to William's practice as well. And then began with a studio vis a site visit and um, and then just conversations, you know, mm -hmm. and and William knows what he's doing and knows what he wants to do and and um, will let me pressure him, but also has a really <laughs> strong um, idea of where you know literally kind of where things should go or the direction something should take, but also really quick to pivot um, if if you know I express something I, I really think this would be an interesting. Um, path to explore something. I remember you being kind of very sensitive to mm -hmm. um, that too. So it was really um, generative um, for me, you know, intellectually and, and kind of the back and forth while also really watching your process that is so strong in and of itself. Yeah. I sh you had a question, sir? I was going to say part two was, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to dominate this whole question. <laughs> the uh, more for William, in this case, because the, the piece in Marfa, I mean, we're looking at the Marfa installation mostly, right? It feels very intentional, mm -hmm. the placement the, the, in that curatorial vision or the artistic vision, as though you've created a world there in that site. And at a higher level, what it feels like to me, and just listening to you talk in the dialogue, it, it, that you're imparting your wisdom in a, in a certain way. That's what it feels like to me. And there's an element of healing, and I, I, that's that's again just my impression. I just thought wanted to throw that back towards you and say, is that does that resonate with you as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, healing has a huge part of my uh, um, installation work. Um, transcending. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, when I evolved as a visual practitioner in school, undergrad, and between that and grad school, I tended to do works where sometimes I would um, make comments or uh, state certain topics that uh, didn't have a, a way home, didn't have a way out. They weren't necessarily about healing. I was just going through a certain motion. And I, um, it should also be about healing. It should be about something else. It should transcend. It should be uh, have certain closures. It Transformative. Also, yeah. Um, otherwise, I'm just going around in circles um, with a wound that will never heal. And I needed to allow that to also function in a different level, different way, so that the viewers can come in and not necessarily feel that weight but also um, use it as a key to navigate somewhere else themselves. So I think it's a, a huge factor in my work overall. Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that yeah. and pick up, picking up on that. Um, I should add that everything, I, I think about 99% of the work that you saw, except for the scaffolding, I, um, my practice devolved in art residencies because um, I wanted to extend my studio practice after graduating from this intense two-year grad program. And I saw a lot of the students who graduated before me uh, move to New York or some other large city and 
they needed to get a job, they needed to reposition themselves in society, and it was very difficult. So a lot of them were not able to get back to, this, to their practice for a year or a year and a half, and it, within that time, they lost focus. And it happens. Uh, I didn't want it to happen, so I thought, what if I go for, from grad school to an art residency program? So I did that, I planned it. Let's try it for two years, I thought, and ended up becoming 10 years. And I was able to, to, to flow from one to the other, to the other, back to back. Um, and there's a sacrifice behind that, but when, that's all I was focused on. You know, I didn't, I didn't have any other obligations at that time. And so I was able to do it for that long. And it takes you out of the commercial process a little bit, which I would absolutely. think would be a good thing. Yeah, because then it show it, it and teaching. You see it in the work. Yeah, and I didn't. Yeah, I didn't teach. Um, not because I don't value it. Um, I just uh, simplified my life to the the most basic thing, and lived in the studio. Um, yeah, squatting in the studio and. Um, even in grad school. So a lot of, I tend to produce a lot more, more work um, slowly, but I do it because I didn't have a lot of obligations. And sometimes I propose that to students who are about to graduate, that they at least give art residencies an opportunity, mm -hmm. because it will affect the way you uh, think and also the, the amount of space that you, um, um, that you utilize mentally and physically. It's um, interesting because it makes your shows feel like a studio. I mean, they feel more like an artist studio than mm -hmm. a typical gallery. It's not mm -hmm. bump, bump, bump. It's like yeah. This, this yeah. thing that you do what you want with. Yeah. Though my studio is a lot messier, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you have a lot of confidence in that space. True. True. So can I pick up on that theme of doing the art residencies? Because to do those, you have to write, obviously, a persuasive application. So I'm wondering now, because we haven't seen like in the traditional artist statement, but the role writing might play in your practice, even though I haven't heard you refer to it, but you must be having to articulate it someplace to put forward these applications. When I was, uh, when I was much younger, I started writing... Um, I think like when the internet really kicked off, or when I took notice of it, about 98, I started writing reviews, mm -hmm. music reviews, on albums that I liked online. And so there was no pressure to, 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 you know, to be like this great academic. And so I would just write, and I would do it almost every day. And when you do it that much, you get better at writing, and you start trying to refine it better. And and then I started reviewing art books and stuff like that. Not for anyone, just like Amazon.com and things like that. You do that for a while when you're not in school, you get really good at it and you start writing other things. Um, so I used that, I realized that I was exercising. And I mean, I had written short stories and stuff like that before and write a lot of poetry, but, but this is different writing. And so when I was about to graduate, then of course I, was, I had to write in school. Um, about things that I didn't necessarily want to write about, but I had to. But I also realized that after writing for so long, um, you just turn it on. And so when I had to write artist statements or proposals, letter of intent for residencies, it wasn't that difficult, you know. And so I'm able to just apply it because I'm always doing it, and um, I'm still writing reviews, but. Uh, I think that's also a, a way to, for students to not be so uh, hesitant to write about art, to write about something you like, something you're really, really passionate about, and just exercise it. And then when you have to, it's not that difficult. Um, it's just like exercising for anything. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I, you know, I update my artist statement all the time, tweak it a lot. but. Um, I don't know if there's any students here, but there is a certain formula to apply to also to art residencies, and um, and kind of realize that early on. So do we have to pay extra for you to tell us what? 
No, he I will usually provide you with copious notes. I can attest if you send him. Something. www. No, um, no. I just I usually share that every time I speak to students when I get invited to universities. Um, yeah, I just tell them to reach out. There's you know there's steps you take. The first thing is to how to document your work. Never document your work as if it looks like for, it's coming from a Sears catalog, mm -hmm. you know, where you isolate the image. Because some students have gigantic paintings that are the size of this entire building, and then they crop everything, and when you project it, you, you can't tell what the scale is. And it has, a lot of times it has to do with scale. And if you can't tell that, you know, how do you contextualize it? So I, I share images of my work. Uh, I always document my own work. So when I give presentations, I show them and then I you know, walk them through it as to why I documented it this way, why I framed it this way, why it's so important to document everything you do, whether it's resolved or not. And, um, and yeah, just like, not necessarily for, so you can become a savvy artist, but to just prepare yourself for, uh, I mean, people prepare night and day before they go on Disney vacations, but mm -hmm. oftentimes, they don't prepare for their career right before they're about to graduate from, from grad school, especially in the visual arts, because they don't really inform us very well in grad programs, um, in studio practices. So that's something I try to provide, because I didn't have that. And so um, if it's information I, I have and can share, then I'm willing to, to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but I'm always open to giving more information about that. Yeah. If there aren't any other questions, because I don't want to cut anybody off, um, I think we'll call it a night, but I just want to confess that this might have been one of the most selfish acts of my life. This was <laughs> solely for me, and clearly um, it paid off for everybody here. So congratulations, you get to say you were here. This is one of those special nights, I think. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you.